Hey everyone, this is Norm Ferrar, aka The Beard Guy here, and welcome to another Lunch with Norm, the Amazon FBA and e-commerce podcast. Lunch with Norm. Lunch with Norm. Lunch with Norm. Have you ever tried to build a successful team? It's not as easy as you think. So today, it's going to be a great podcast. We're going to be um, talking to John Hefter about how to build a successful team. So John uh, is over at Thrasio. Uh, you've probably heard him on all sorts of different podcasts. He's frequently over at Seller Sessions. Anyways, uh, he's a great guy. He's going to just give us some insight into what he knows. But before we get into that, uh, I just wanted to, this is the biggest thing, is to say thank you to our sponsor, Global Wired Advisors, of course, a leading digital investment bank focused on optimizing the business sales process. For more information, please contact globalwiredadvisors.com. All right. Now, with that being said, where are you, Kelsey? Hello. I'm hey, back in Toronto. Going? Good, good. Doing yeah, fantastic. In your, in your My dungeon. Little, yeah, closet there. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Yeah, the salary is working nicely. Oh, good. See, there yeah. you go. You got a closet. Uh, yeah, yeah, leveling up. Uh, okay, so yes, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the show. It's good to see everyone. If you guys haven't yet, please smash those like buttons. Also, uh, if you want to find full episodes or daily highlights, you can go over to our YouTube page, um, Norman Ferrard. That's where all of the good stuff is. Also, uh, we do have a really great prize. We actually have two prizes that we're going to be announcing um, shortly. And yeah, if you haven't already, uh, please head over to our Facebook group, uh, Lunch with Norm, Amazon FBA, and E-Commerce Collective. And uh, that's where everything happens. That's where the good stuff is. And I can see that we got Mark joining us already. Welcome to the Beard Nation, as well as Dr. Cause. Good morning. Good morning. John is the man. Yes, he yeah. is. Okay, so if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the comment sections. Also, if you're looking to catch the next episode of Lunch with Norm, make sure you like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube. We're almost at a thousand subscribers, so it'd be really great to get over that hump there. But uh, also Instagram too, you can give us a follow. Just search uh, Norm Farrar and you'll be able to find that. And welcome, I believe this is Rad and Jessica Rabbit. Also all the way from Daniel, uh, from Brazil, Daniel. All the way from great. Daniel. All the way from Daniel. Yeah, it's been a long morning. Okay, welcome everyone. So we can jump right into it now. Okay, so I, I'm really excited about this because um, Thrasio, as uh, you all know, is the fastest billion dollar evaluation ever in the history, I think, of sale or, or in business, right? I, I'm going to get John to confirm that. But um, anyways, I can't wait to talk. Uh, this is going to be a good one. I love um, listening to entrepreneurs and you know figuring out how they scale their business. It's such a tough thing to do. So let's get started. So sit back. If you have any questions, throw it over into the Facebook or into the comment section. We'll get to the questions and sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee and enjoy the show. John, where are you? Hey, what's up, Norm? Hey I am, uh, I'm currently in Boston, Massachusetts, but uh, I'm on the start of a very rugged travel schedule for the next uh, 120 days or so. But okay. uh, what are you doing? Home for a minute. What do I do? Um, so I'm. Uh, no, no, no. Where are you going? Yeah, Prosper's well, one for sure, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Geek Out San Diego, Prosper, some meetings in Croatia, an event in Mexico, back out to see a Romanian team. Um, and then Serbia, and then an event in Kiev, Wyoming, and then I'm back home for a bit. Oh, so uh, it's going to be a little bit of a, a stretch for me, but I'm in for the Lama Marathon runner. Actually, not really, but uh, <laughs> for th in this case, I, I am. Uh, you know, see you. John, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a triathlete. Fantastic. Yeah, Kelsey, um, I, I hook onto his back. He swims. <laughs> then when it comes to the bicycling thing, it's a two bicycle, you know, two person bicycle thing. And then he pushes me in a wheelchair all the way to the finish line. Perfect. He, but he never makes it to the end. That's the thing that really sucks. I just, ah, if he'd only try harder. <laughs> so, John, now let's talk about what you do. 
Sure. Yeah. So I'm um, I'm the one of the founders of uh, of Thrasio. Um, so we started with an idea in 2017 to um, do an e-commerce play. It was a little unspecified for a while when we started playing with it. Became clear to us that uh, Amazon FBA was a, a a place to play in for the sole purpose. I mean, for the sole reason, really, because um, one, it was something that you could scale because the operational complexity was similar across different category domains. It's a little bit different in, in the e-commerce space. You need different types of teams for different things, but we thought we could build a platform. And what we discovered um, too, was that as these FBA businesses were growing, um, normally as a business grows, you find a way to get more efficient. But actually what was happening for a lot of these sort of, we'll call them a mom and pop for lack of a better term, FBA sellers, as they scaled, they were they were losing efficiency um, because they they didn't really have the ability to, what we're going to talk about today, scale teams to really figure out how to run a professional supply chain operation, to run um, marketing as good as an agency might do it, or to create really awesome branding that goes across things, or to have a legal team that can deal with compliance, all these other things that sort of put a you know, can, can put a hitch in a small business, we were going to build a system that allowed us to do all of those things and incrementally improve any business that we took over. So that's what we set out to do. 2018, there's four of us who started the company. I believe we incorporated March or April of 2018. Um, since then, uh, we just eclipsed our thousandth employee uh, about six weeks ago. Um, and uh, we should do a roughly a run rate of uh, 1.4, 1.5 billion if everything stays uh, on schedule by the end of the year this year. Right. And I was correct, right? You were the fastest growing company to a $1 billion evaluation. Uh, fastest profitable company in the U.S. ever to get a, uh, a billion dollar valuation. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Uh, I, you know, back in 2014, 15, 16, it was very hard to sell uh, an Amazon FBA business. Um, all of a sudden now, everybody and his mother is coming out of the closet trying to buy Amazon FBA businesses. Where was the change? Where was that turning point? That's, I mean, that's a good question. Look, the, when we started, there really wasn't a sophisticated M&A market in this space. Um, there were some investment banker plays who were, who, were, who were working at the higher end of the spectrum, $15 million-ish brands plus that were in the space. Um, there were some people who tried aggregation, but they hadn't really gotten any momentum with fundraising. And maybe some of their choices really weren't optimal to, to actually have success in the space. Uh, and then the majority of the people who were buying were, were getting SBA business loans. Um, and they were U.S. buyers who didn't have any Amazon experience. So what we really, I you know, we're, we're certainly a catalyst and I think actually the creators of this zeitgeist of, you know, an M&A market where we're well-funded, have operational capacity and experience that can actually take on these brands and then and then make them better. Um, so we proved out a thesis that that you can do this if you line everything up correctly. And you now, uh, imitation is the the, the most uh, you know best part of the flattering part of uh, uh, whatever that saying is. I've, I've lost it for a moment, but it doesn't matter. Um, is that uh, when people saw that it worked, then there's sort of been this gold rush to get into the market. And, and I think we're at a really interesting inflection point, and I don't know exactly where, where we'll end up. I know this, that that the people who have entered this space, some of them will become great operators and hopefully will still always be the the best, but you know, there, there could always be more players in the space. For every Ford, there's a Chevy and eventually a GM and so on and so forth, and we expect that to be the case. But we also think there's a lot of people who've entered in this gold rush and they don't have the right tools, equipment, know-how, ability, whatever it is to actually execute on this thesis. So what we see is we see a, a, an upward trajectory and, and the M&A opportunities that exist, perhaps the multiples that will come with that, that will probably be a, somewhat of a bubble in the next year or so. Uh, and then, then uh, as the fog sort of clears, there'll be five or six perhaps real players in the space Right, and then the rest will sort of fall by the wayside, and and we'll see where that that happens. And I say that as a a, a warning, perhaps to anyone who's looking to to exit their business. Everyone's going to say the right things. Who has the provenance and the history to actually do the right things and can look back to say we have done it? Um, so I just I don't want to see anyone get burnt. There's plenty of great opportunities if you're in the market to sell your business. 
Um, and I want to make sure that everyone gets the the best outcome. And, and, and I mean that wholeheartedly. I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I see this as a non mercantile setup here in the Amazon space. The pie is not being split. It's just getting bigger and mm -hmm. people have different chunks of the pie. So for me, having more competition is fine. Having capable M and a people is great. Having that, that'll allow more sellers to have more opportunities to sell, which will bring more people in the market. And there's a potential here for everybody to win. And I, I hope that's what we see. One more question before we get into the topic today, a lot of people out there, I've heard of aggregators. What's the difference between private equity or a broker compared to versus an aggregator? Sure. Well, I mean, the M and A process with a with with a uh, private equity is is really pretty extensive, deep, long, hard, complicated, right? Uh, and then then often too, you'll be partnered with someone who might not have the specific esoteric Amazon experience that'll actually know really what to do with your brand. So the, the multiple sometimes you can get on the private equity side will be more attractive potentially, but the complexity and the like, the likelihood of handholding by you as the former operator for an extended period of time after you've exited is super high. Um, the, the aggregator piece, which we don't actually like to call ourselves really an aggregator. It's sort of a, a misnomer for us because at the end of the day, we're really, we're first class operators. Right, and that's what we've proven is, is all, virtually every brand that we've acquired, it's over 125 now, have seen significant growth post acquisition. So we see ourselves really as the most capable FBA operators in the entire space, um, who ha who happens to have an M and A engine that 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 drives, you know, some of our our, our really exacerbated growth. Um, right. But to me, that's really like if I was going to if I had an FBA business and I was going to sell it, I would spend most of my time. Yeah, you know, like find a price range that you're comfortable with, see who's attracted to it. And I would spend most of my time learning how they do operations and and just see like what's really behind the curtain. Is it is it built on something that's um that's on solid footing, or is there is there something more to be seen? Great. Okay. So before we get to the questions, or before we get to my questions, <laughs> um, let's talk about the giveaway. What do we have today? Okay, so for me, what I want to do is um, I love branding. I love product launch, right? I also can talk my ear off on a, a ton of other specific topics related to running a business or running an Amazon aggregator or, or brand building or, pro or whatever it is. I'll give someone a half an hour of my time um, to look at their product roadmap, to look at their current branding, to look at a new concept they might have. And I'll help them hopefully uh, get the best potential outcome for it or or at least set them on the path to start that process. Um, and I'll do that like completely open as if it was my own brand that I'm helping out. It's actually something I really enjoy doing. Um, and I've even uh, helped out people who are in a space that we're also in because I'm I'm just that sort of type of person that doesn't really at the scale we're at with 20, 30,000 products. Why wouldn't I help somebody? It doesn't right. make any sense to me that I, why I wouldn't. So I'd love to uh, help one of your listeners out to find a direction and maybe a fun angle to sell a product. Well, that sounds fantastic. So it's not very often you get one of the founders of the fastest growing uh, or fastest growing, fastest to a billion dollar evaluation, Theracio, to help you out for 30 minutes. I'd, uh, I don't even know what that's worth. It's worth a lot of money. So if you're interested in that, mm -hmm. Hashtag Wheel of Kelsey. Ha uh, Kelsey, we also have uh, from Marsha Reese, one of uh, from Staywell Copper, one of her uh, copper plates today, correct? Yep. So if you are from US or Canada, anywhere in North America, you're eligible for the second pro uh, contest. That is hashtag I want to stay well. And that is for a copper uh, back plate. Uh, I have one on my phone here. Um, but yeah, that is from our Beard Nation member, Marsha Reese, uh, who's donated them for us. So thank you, Marsha. And uh, yeah, visit uh, staywellcopper.com for more information. And thank you. Okay, so it, I guess it's hashtag staywellcopper, right? Hashtag I want, I want to stay well. Okay, there we go. He, he never does his job. Never. Uh, <laughs> all right, John, let's get into it. I love scaling teams. I have never scaled 
the volume that you've scaled so quickly. Uh, let's talk about how you do it. Where do you even start off? What are some of the difficulties scaling your team? That's a, that's, that's a great question. I love this topic. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to, uh, well, to be traveling and be talking at a lot of events. This is the topic, you know, when you're speaking to an audience, you're, you're actually really, you're having a dialogue, even though you're the one speaking. This is the topic when the room goes silent, which to me means like people are really listening mm -hmm. because there is, it's this sort of like black box of like, how do I do this? How do I create an environment that allows me to scale without losing my mind, without having massive points of failure with, with you know, without all of the sort of like tragedies that you create in your mind that don't exist. Um, so to me, um, th there's a lot of ways to look at it. The, the way that I am really most interested in is the psychological mindsets that it takes to actually uh, embark in a journey that will allow you to scale. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine uh, about an another person who's doing great um, in the e-commerce space. And he looked at me and he said, you know, that guy's a $3 million guy. And it wasn't to disparage this guy who's built a really great business. What he was saying was that this person's brain will block themselves from scaling a team because he looks at the world only as a top-down organization where I'm the most brilliant person who has all the best ideas, who needs to be in control of everything, who needs to come up with every new idea, who needs to review every piece of content that I produce, oh. right? And, and, and so that mindset, that ego, that egocentric mindset that only I can perform great things in this world is one of the first things that you have to let go. So check your ego at the door. Check your ego at the door and you have to let go of control. So there's a quote from Mario Andretti that I, I use fairly often where he said something akin to, if you feel in control when you're driving, you're not driving fast enough. That that you you need to embark and understand this this chaos. And we actually have a term that we use, it's called letting go of your Legos. So when you're a kid, you're playing with the Legos, you don't wanna give them to someone else, right? But the reality is, is that you have to let go of things. You need to accept then and understand this very simple analogy that I can train five to 10 people to be 90% versions of myself. If I really obsess about it, I can make them pretty good derivatives of what I am and whatever I'm good at. Um, that's that's about where you can scale. That's where you're limited. But would you be willing to accept 100, 500, 1,000 people who are 80% as good as you? And which one would likely lead to better outcomes for your business if you're trying to scale it? The latter is obviously better. But that requires um, this really letting go of things. It also requires, I think, being humble enough to, to really take a clear assessment of your weaknesses and to understand what you're good at and what you're really not good at. And what do you like doing and what do you hate doing? Don't so do strengths, things. strengths and weaknesses. Correct. Don't yeah. do things you hate. I have no interest in doing QuickBooks type work or doing accounting stuff. I'm awful at it. Why would I waste 10 hours a month, 20 hours a month of my brain power, right? To try to do things that I hate that I just want to push away as fast as I can. I need to find compliments to people who are more structured and organized and are good in those domains um, and figure out what life I really want to live. And, and to me, it comes down to understanding your weaknesses. And some of it might be norm, something that you said that it was the same for me a few years ago is I never built a team of a thousand people before. Where do, where, how the hell do you start? Well, I know a good place to start. Um, and it's something that Carlos and Josh did an amazing job with was identifying when we were 50 employees that we needed to hire someone who had experience building and working with teams that were over 10,000 people. So they could come in, bring the systems in, bring all of that networking and policies, procedures, so on and so forth to deal with that level of scaling. And part of the chaos piece too is committing to probably neutral returns for an extended period of time. If you really believe in your business and you really think that it, it has potential to have massive growth, you need to commit to growth. That means investing in HR resources. That means hiring maybe a president because maybe you're a great tinkerer or a great branding person, but are you really the business leader who should be running the operation? 
you know, it might be hiring a great sourcing person, a creative team, whatever it is. And, and you have to have enough self-belief and commitment in your business thesis that if I do those things, good things will eventually happen, but it will take time. You know, one of the things on a much smaller scale that we're, we're, we look at is that we create the task board. We work with the 10 10, 100, $1,000, $10,000 job. You've probably heard of that. You know, then, then we start to assign the tasks. We typically have one major person that will hire full time. And then we hire experts. We hire, you know, the person that might be just for, and, and again, much smaller scale, but just the person that we can count on for Facebook ads, Google ads, writing content, and the other person just becomes the maestro, right? They're man, they're just working and delegating, and uh, uh, you know th that's one way for us to 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 get going. And the other thing is, I have made. I was talking on Clubhouse the other day in my room about the biggest mistake I've probably made at the beginning was thinking I was a really great hiring expert. I sucked at it. And, you know, if you uh, if you get the right person, I mean, every time you make a bad hire, I, I've read it costs about five thousand dollars. I just think about that. And I've made a lot of bad hires until I, I, I got my process down. But, um, yeah, do you want to expand on that? Yeah. I, uh, so hiring's a really tricky thing. I, I said often, like, uh, even I can act normal for one date. You know what I mean? Like, so it's, it's, it's really, it's really, it's a really hard thing to get right. And, and there aren't necessarily like, um, specific tricks and tactics I can use to be better hirers. There are some pointed questions you can get to it, but there are HR people and expertise that exists out in the world, um, where you can get better at it and they'll be able to see things that maybe you don't really look at clearly. It might be something as simple as like, well, I see eight jobs in in nine years. I think that's a problem. We might not look at that as we're looking through a resume. We might just looking at they have the Shopify experience that we need. So for me, the what I, what I'm going to turn this on is uh, is a couple of ways to look at the world that I look at it. Sometimes you get someone in a room and they're clearly smarter than you, and whatever it is they're trying to do, and maybe you're good at all kinds of things, but you're like this person clearly knows. Um, Power BI software, product launch thesis, branding, supply chain, and they're way smarter than me. That to me is the best opportunity to hire someone and, and get them, do whatever it takes to bring them in the door. I'm a believer and we're a believer in long-term commitments to people. And we're really a believer in being humble enough to hire people and be brave enough to hire people who are smarter than you. And then let them go out in the woods and leave them, leave them alone. I love it. That's another thing too. Like I, I hired a guy in, who runs our Utah office. And by the way, here's another thing when it comes to geo hires, um, I don't care where you are. If you're really bright and you're really good at what you, at what you do, we'll start an office anywhere. It could be a virtual office. It could end up being a, a real office. Because I find that most people who are really bright and good at things also have friends who are really bright and good at things. And if you create an environment where you've sold them on a vision you've committed enough financial resources to them and give them an opportunity opportunity to really grow with the company, whether it's a clear pathway to a better salary, whether it's equity in the company, which is something that we do aggressively, um, whether it's a just a powerful vision of how their life will find higher purpose with working with this company and this company is going places and you need to be a part of this ride. That part to me, um, the employee retention part, is perhaps more valuable and less focused on than perhaps making the right hires. To me, and we have on Glassdoor, it's something ridiculous. It's 97 point something percent uh, retention rate for our employees. Why? We give them autonomy. We give smart people freedom to, to work how they want to work when they want to work. Um, we have lofty goals and lofty visions in the sense that like we want dreamers who want to climb the, the, the mountaintop who want to go over the horizon and check out the unknown and build something that they'll be proud of for the rest of their lives. We set a, a real vision for them. We pay them well. We give them good equity. We treat them well. We create a culture that's not too stiff. It's sort of, we, you know, um, 
any any jester can make fun of the king at our company. Humor is a big piece of what we use, and we try to create a place where people want to stay. And when you get good people, they want to bring their friends. And we get so many referrals from smart people who say, "Dude, this is the best job I've ever had. These people are great. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring in someone else." And then you retain them because, just like you said, Norm, it's so hard to retrain somebody, put them through the whole process. I'd much rather have reliable people that I can make better and super smart people who will bring their super smart friends than anything else. So I think you need to frame yourself as as a as a look at long term retention and think that don't think about the short term. Well, geez, this might be a little bit too much money, or I don't want to give away a piece of my business or whatever it is. Think about what you could be mm-hmm. if, if all of those things came into place and people were banging down your door, talented people to come help you build your brand. You know, one of the things that I, I really liked hearing you say at the beginning was 80%, not 100%, but if somebody could be 80%, people are going to make mistakes. And I've talked to uh, a lot of um, small business owners, entrepreneurs, maybe med- medium size. And at the beginning, a lot of the frustration is because their people are not properly trained. So they go out, they hand the information over to the person, they make a mistake, and of course they get screamed at. So the first thing that happens is the person's afraid to approach you uh, with solutions. You know, people are going to make mistakes. And I love what I heard about, you know, just don't micromanage. Let people do it, you know, and, and one of the things that we try to do here is uh, anybody in the company, they don't come to me. They don't come to, you know, any of the uh, project managers. They come with solutions. We try to do that right at the very beginning. Hey, look, at we do incredible SOPs, or I, I like to say policies and procedures. So it's in depth. They know why they're doing it. They're doing the buy-in. And we have, instead of 10 steps, there might be 30 steps, every little click. If, if there's a mistake, we know it's going to be step X. And usually if there's a mistake, it's because of me or because of one of the project managers who, or it's because something's changed on the platform like Amazon. You don't scream at somebody for that. You have them come back to you with a solution. And now you're, you're building that solution oriented culture, which I love, but everything, what you're saying is right on track. And one other thing I hear a lot of people talk about, Oh, and it almost sounds like they take, um, incredible, um, it's like a badge of honor being able to go and get somebody at two bucks an hour, you know, and, Oh, I'm going to pay $2 an hour or less. Well, you're going to get $2 worth of loyalty. You know, you pay, you pay for people, you get them to, I mean, you want to make sure that they're secure. And if they're not secure, the person that pays 10 cents more, $2 and 10 cents, guess what? There's going to be a family emergency and they're not going to be working with you that week. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Long winded. <laughs> no, it's fine. Like, you're, you're spot on there. And, and like, I, I want loyalty. And here's another, another thing too. If you don't create a culture where people are willing to admit their mistakes for fear of some, you know, some type of retribution, right. Uh, or, or, or shaming perhaps, then this is what happens. Uh, problems get stuffed under the rug. Mm. Your employees will just hide real problems for you. And as a saying that I actually, I, I think I coined, it's like never be afraid to tell the Kremlin there's a fire. Right. And I, I mean, by that luckily the, the Chernobyl incident, Right. Now there was just fear to actually send bad news up the top and then look what literally a nuclear meltdown happened. Well, those things can happen in a practical sense in your business. I'll give an example of this. Finally, when I um, got vaccinated, I already had COVID. I was like, I'm traveling. I'm done. I'm going to meet my teams and whoever's comfortable come in the offices. They can come in to meet. So I went to Utah first, I believe. And I sat down with every subgroup right? Like uh, people that I don't have meetings with very regular people who build flat files and so on and so forth, build our listings. And I was like, all right, guys, tell me everything that's going right. I want to know everything that you guys love about this place and what you really enjoy. 
five minutes. I'm not actually really interested in that. That's, I'm, I'm always interested in solving problems, right? Now I want you to tell me, no matter how much minutia you think this is, everything that's going wrong. Let's do something I call burning off dead wood. Is there a part of our systems that we've built that were appropriate for the time, but now have been a total waste of time? An example of that might be in our M&A process. We might run something as a piece of diligence that we do, and it takes up 30 man hours of very expensive M&A people, but never has it once affected our decision that we make at the end. That's dead wood that needs to be burnt off. Um, and I had a person who's wonderful on our team, super bright, but never talks, never calls meetings, never does anything like that. She raised her hand and she said, we have this compliance thing that should be taking um, three days max, and it's taking 18 to 28 days every time, delaying my launches by almost a month. And I never would have gotten that piece of information had I not sat down person to person and said, what's going wrong here? How do we fix things? And by the way, if you're a leader, spend a lot of time talking about the mistakes you've made in the past. Talk about how often you are foolish and talk about a culture that's a fail forward place, that we're here to learn, that credit, you know, blame goes up, credit goes down. To build a culture where people are not afraid to tell you the problems that exist. Because as you scale, if you have people who are afraid to talk about problems, you are screwed. Something big is going to happen. You're going to have your own nuclear meltdown. So let's talk about the small, medium uh, FBA seller. Scaling. What's, what's the right pace? Like, you know, I've heard people talk and say, you know, oh, go out and get one VA and then scale from there. Go out and get, you know, as many people as you want. In your mind, like when you see these and you've gone through so many different brands, right? Is there a, a right or wrong way to scale? And there's a wrong way. I, I know that much, which is... Uh, and I'm talking on pace. Yeah, on way. pace. Like, yeah. you know, there's there's a wrong way, which is like, you have no idea what you're aiming at, which to me means you're going to miss your target every time. Right. So literally the definition of sin, right? The, the Greek translation is to miss your mark. Well, then you need a target to focus in on. So to me, it's what are my goals? What is my objective? Where do I want to be? Then I work my way back from there as to my level of aggression. But to, to have to, to wander through the world and be like, well, I listen to a couple of podcasts and they say, you know, you should hire one VA first. And I'm doing that because that's what I think is good. No, you need to say, hey, I have a plan to scale this business by X, Y, or Z to launch 40 more products, to launch two more brands, to do whatever it is I'm going to do to grow this business. And then I work back from a needs hierarchy as to like, what are the things that are actually going to help me accomplish this? What are my strengths? What can I do that only I can do? And how do I maximize that use of my time? What's the stuff I hate and how can I outsource that? What's the stuff I have zero experience in that I need to either hire an agency or hire a person to do it for me? And what are the, the pinch points that are going to prevent me from reaching my goals? And then, and then make a commitment and you have to play this game of poker in my mind. And this isn't the right for everybody, depending on your own living situation. But a successful poker player does not look at the chips on the table as his or her money. They look at it as tools of the game. And the different mindset that is, is, is like you need to make a commitment to that chaos, that driving a little bit too fast, that I'm going to forget about short-term profit. I'm going to sacrifice the short term for the potential long term. And I'm going to commit to people and I'm going to commit to the potential of growth that's in front of me. And there are obviously hundreds of other factors, Norm, that go into making these types of decisions. But it's that mindset. And to me, it's knowing exactly what I want. And then also know, knowing exactly why I think I'm going to win. And, and I always have a, an analogy that I use. It's like um, when I was about 10 years old, I used to like playing video games. Um, and instead of trying to win the game in the hardest setting, I would always try to like, if I was playing football or hockey, right? Let's see, you're, you're Canada, so I'll, I'll do hockey here, right? I'd have Jeremy Roenick try to score 197 goals in a season on the easiest setting. And I literally thought to myself, I was like, all right, well, I actually have like a, a pathology, like a psychological weakness. I'm not brave enough to like, uh, you know, try the hardest thing. 
And I was thinking about that when I was 10 years old. I realized when I was older, it's like, no, I just like playing games. I know I'm going to win. That to me is, is a good time. And, and how do I do that? Let's say I'm launching new products. I create a scenario where I do a sales pitch to myself. And I say, why, if I'm launching a lemon squeezer, why is my lemon squeezer going to win? Is it outside traffic? Is it better branding? Is it a better product? Is it better pictures? Is it a better offer? Is it a combination of those things? How am I going to penetrate the market? What, why, why is this thing going to win in a sea of everything else? And to me, that objective and that thesis for your business or your products needs to be understood and fleshed out. And you need to be, how do I say this? If you're not willing to commit to that project, then maybe you're not aimed at the right thing. Even if you go into the red for a while. Yes. And yeah. and for me too, it's, it's, how do I phrase it? It's, it's something like this. It's like, if you're not willing to go into the red for one of your products for, a t or have a six month neutral investment in, into it, then is your thesis that great? Right. Do you, did you really find a winner or are you just sort of like going through the match, like the, you know, iterations of, of what you think you should do. But when you do have a winner, a potential winner, like that to me, it's just an easier place to get into a frame of commitment. I've seen so many really great products, great listings, but they stay stagnant because there's no external traffic or the person's not investing in PPC. You just can't get off the ground. It's okay. I spent all this money. Amazon should be promoting me. And it's the wrong attitude. Yep. Now that you've got it, you've got to go get out there and sell. And that's the same thing with your uh, with with building up these VAs. You know, you have to go out. You have to find really great VAs and get them to to at least give them a guideline what you want them to do. Hunter, give them a guideline and, and be very clear with those guidelines and understand too that like I don't know what depending on the on the territory what VAs are going for. Right. But like if you can secure someone I'm making this number up instead of 300 a week, they're ecstatic at 320 a week. Mm -hmm. Pay them the 320. Yeah. Have that person be there for you, not bounce around and take all the things they've learned from you and, and go give it to another company. That's a that's a great point. Yeah. Just don't go the two bucks. <laughs> yeah. This is, you know, and you know, this is, this is crazy and I hope he's not listening, but, um, I, I had a guy, um, a, a really incredible content writer that, uh, he was, um, uh, he had his MBA in, I forget, but anyways, uh, he came from Nigeria, 68 cents an hour for incredible content. And I couldn't, I could not pay him 68 cents an hour. So I paid him $1.50 an hour. Now it's much more. But in the day, I mean, that $1.50, almost double or double, uh, he couldn't do enough for me. Yep. You know, but I felt so guilty, even at $1.50. Now he's $8 an hour, he's happy. <laughs> but, yep. but at the time, you know, it, and you make people happy. If And this is another point um, you, you talked about this just briefly at the beginning, but make sure when you're hiring that you, you make sure that the, um, the internet is up, that they're running proper. If they're running dial up, you know, you're going to pay double or triple. If they have a slow computer, you know, get them a computer. If they're at that point where you've got them on board and you, maybe you've given them a probation period then make a deal, get them that computer, get them the, the stuff that you need. I know in the Philippines, um, in some of the locations we buy generators. I've said this on the podcast before, but if the person is set up to succeed, then you're set. You're one step further. If, if the power's out, you know, once or twice a month and they have a crappy computer and crappy internet, you set them up to fail. 100%. I also think it's another thing that's good to think about as you start to scale your business is you have remote offices, finding really reliable generals mm. who run those places for you, right? And maybe, maybe you get to a point where you have 10 VAs. Well, one of them better be 
a well-paid functional arm of your business who says, Hey, you know, I think we actually need it. We need a real office because I'm going to build these training programs and make sure they get done. And I'm going to do this reporting for you. And I'm going to make sure everything's good. And we'll have a check-in once a week, once every two weeks to make sure that everything is running according to plan. Now, just imagine, I, I can imagine people listening right now, like th- feeling a, a heightened sense of security about having that person, whatever remote office they have. And to me, I can't stress that enough to need good leaders, right? You need good leaders who, um, if you were to go away for a month, you know, and uh, you're, you're stuck in Canada. So I don't know, you were going to go to uh, to uh, Bismarck for, uh, <laughs> you know, you know for, for the summer and not check your work. Would everything be functional and running well, relatively well? Because by the way, that should be your goal. Mm-hmm. If you're not doing good job in business leadership, if your everyday commitment is necessary for the business to be operated correctly. And who taught me that was really was Carlos Cashman, you know, one of the other co-founders. And he said to me something akin to this. He was like, um, you're working too much. You want to do better, do less. And I was like, what the hell? What does that even mean? When I first thought, you know, I was, I was that naive, really. It was sort of like, what does that mean? And I really started to to think about it. And, and what, he, what he was saying is that, like, if you set things up properly and you put the right people in place, you don't need to work as much. And that's right. actually a reflection of how good you are at your job, not how bad. And all of us who start in entrepreneurial mindsets are doers. We're all dreamers and doers, right? And, and we have this delusion that we need to always be the doers in order to be good at what we are doing. And I think that's a miscalculation. I think a better understanding of it is, no, we need, need to do the things that we're really good at and empower people to run the business for us if we're going to have any level of scaling success. Really get great insights. Uh, okay, we're going to stop here for a second. I'm just going to remind people if you want to have the 30-minute 30 ses- uh, 30 session uh, with John, it's hashtag Wheel of Kelsey. Also for uh, Marsha Reese's uh, Stay Well Copper Plate for the back of your phone uh that is i want to stay well hashtag i want to stay well so uh also if you want a second uh entry just tag two people okay so and we have a hard cutoff at uh one o'clock today so let's get into some of the questions kels sure yeah we have a bunch of questions coming in uh First one from Kyle, how much revenue should I have before trying to hire out the work I'm doing, working 50 plus hours a week of building my Amazon and Shopify business? It's very hard to to give any direct specificity here, Um, but you can do some rough math is is what I would say to do. And I would say, look at that 50 hours a week. Again, how much do you enjoy doing and how much do you absolutely hate doing? And that's where I would start is, is, um, and, and I would say, how much of that work is preventing you to, from actually growing your business? I would start there. And I would say, it doesn't always have to be a, a full-time person, too. It can be someone who does your accounting for you. Mm-hmm. It can be someone who's outsourcing and doing your branding. It can be a project manager assistant who's helping you out 15 hours a week till you figure it out. It all depends on you, but I would look at how your revenue is scaling, what your actual net margins are after everything's considered, and how much of that you're willing to play with to commit to people. And I would make sure that um, whatever or whoever you hired was either making your life easier so you could grow your business or directly helping you grow your business. And that would be my my thin sliced answer for you. Very good. Uh, from Simon, what are John's thoughts on the antitrust issue and the potential of Amazon being forced to break up in the not too distant future? Yeah, it's a, it's a hard thing to predict. Um, I, I would say that the likelihood where I think the anti-competitive piece is really coming into is not like a standard oil breakup, really, but more that they probably will stop selling their own products. That's where I see this sort of going, at least in the near future. Um, and as far as the marketplace being split up, I, I, I don't see that as being a likely major f- threat in, in the near future. But again, this is not, I'm going to say, the first one to say this is not my domain of expertise. So, Boy, I'd, I would love that. 
<laughs> okay, uh, I believe this is from Tony. Is Thrasher planning to go public? Um, my my legal team has told me that all options are on the table and anything is possible. Next question. <laughs> all right, great. <laughs> okay, from Anka, uh, do you launch your own new brands or you just acquire brands and then scale them up? Uh, we launch our own brands, yeah. Um, so we will... Total new products this year will be just now, uh, we're planning north of 500 products launched. Um, a lot of those are extensions, variations of, of brands we've acquired, but we'll have at least 10 or 15 in-house brands that we're building from scratch. And some of them are tied to really cool licensing plays, a little bit of celebrity plays that are that are in play right now. And others are just opportunities that we've just seen where there's massive demand um, generally some level of complexity so it's hard to people to enter the space and low or low quality competition and i love it I, I love brand building so for me it's like super fun to play with those toys awesome okay uh from simon to scale and be su successful a business needs to be profitable how is thrashio addressing the rising cost of shipping and materials well it's interesting like when you when you deal with this sort of thing there's a couple ways to look at it Number one, if you're having that and we're the you know a massive multi-billion dollar company, um, we're going to be dealing with it less than others. We'll be getting preferred rates or at least preferred timing on some of these things because of our scale. Um, but we realize that our competition is facing the same thing too. Right. So if, if minimum wage goes from you know nine bucks to thirty bucks, well then burgers go from five bucks to twenty bucks and everyone's dealing with the same squeeze so you make a commitment to raise your prices to deal with the the shrink shrinkage in margins or you make a commitment to keep prices relatively flat and put pressure on your competition it's bound to change i mean if it's not changing if you don't see it on amazon right now it might be an inventory play but at some point if your shipping costs have gone up or your landed costs have gone up, it's, it's going to go right across the board. If, if everyone's dealing with it, is, it, is it really a problem? Right. In the sense, like if I'm, if I'm playing a football game and someone puts a 50 pound backpack on me and it's just me with it, then it's a problem. But if everyone else has to put on a 50 pound backpack, well, the, the, the dynamics of the game has changed a little bit, but you know, the, the chance for positive results still remain the same. And, and for your competitors, if they don't change with it and they want to stay with the same pricing and they're not making any money, they won't be in the game very long. Yep. Okay, we just have a couple more left uh, from Jessica Rabbit. Uh, what books does John recommend reading to get or maintain the right headspace to scale big? <laughs> no, 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 I, 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 read, I read a ton and this is a really tough question for me. Um, I find that a lot of the books that I read um, are really related to economics, psychology, sociology, things of that nature. And I extract a lot of things that are valuable for positive headspace from those things. So I, you know, I, a couple authors I would recommend are like um, for economics would be like Thomas Sowell. I like reading a lot of the classic philosophers and that can get really abstract though. From a direct business standpoint, I would say um, uh, read read a book about OKRs. If you if you haven't gotten that space, it's definitely dry material, but stuff that's um that's really useful. Um, there's uh, you know I'm gonna pull up. I mean, you know what I'll do real quick is I'll just pull up my Audible library. It's stuff I'm reading right now. Um, but uh, another thing too, I would say is train yourselves. If 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 you guys travel a lot or you like to work around the house or anything. Get Audible if you like listening to books. Um, I would say uh, try to train yourself to listen between one and a half and two and a half times speed. And you can read, you can process books uh, amazingly fast. Uh, another great book to look at is uh, a book called Give and Take by Adam Grant. Mm -hmm. um, is another one. I'm reading The Quest uh, for Cosmic Justice right now uh, by Thomas Sowell, The Innovation Stack uh, by Jim McKelvey, um, The Laws of Human Nature by by Robert Greene, a little dry, um, but uh, yeah, th those are people I would say I, I would I would recommend um, for life principles and stuff too. I, I really uh, am a fan of uh, of Twelve Rules for Life is a great book to to read as well, um, and that's what's on my list right now. Oh. 
I, you know, I'll go back. You probably most of the people that are listening right now have heard me talk about this many, 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 many times. But what changed my life uh, and the way that I run business is Michael Gerber's The E-Myth and also The E-Myth Academy. It shows you how to set up, find scalable and automated systems to grow your business. Also, Crossing the Chasm, it's more for tech, but for hyper growth, that's another interesting book to read. There's also a, a system that you're probably very familiar with, John, is uh, the EOS system. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, that's another way that you can go and, and check it out. But I still think um, I went through the E-Myth Academy. Uh, I think you can do it online now, which is uh, pretty good if, if you're interested in scaling. Okay. And then I think we have time for one more question and then we'll All get right. to the wheel and wrap things up uh, from Dr. Cause. Hey, John, regarding brand building, what are your favorite top of funnel methods to increase traffic and must do nuggets for off Amazon building? brand authority, et cetera. Also, John, please pump out more YouTube vids. I've uh, been really enjoying your channel. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, I'll try. Um, so for, for me, that's a that's a really good question. I, it really depends. Just know this simple fact is that uh, Amazon loves outside traffic and they're gonna continue to love it more to secure their marketplace for the future. So. What I would say is, again, I'm willing, uh, to, willing to sacrifice the short term for the long term um, to know you're going on a on an eight day hunt, but maybe it'll, there'll be a mammoth at the other end, which is, you know, like a, we're as humans, like we're we're physically very feeble in comparison to other primates, but we were the first ones to be able to see the potential of the future, and and so we learned how to do sacrifice. The same thing goes for your sort of like your your brand building, as abstract and crazy as that might seem. I would I make, make a commitment of saying, hey, I'm going to launch a DTC site. I'm going to run Facebook traffic and I'm going to run it to my site, but I'm also going to split it off and run some directly to Amazon if I believe that it's going to be, uh, you know, functional from a conversion rate perspective that's close enough to what the, the, the average is there. I'm going to uh, try Snapchat. I'm going to try to get a YouTube influencer. I'm going to try to get an Instagram influencer. I'm going to try to get some way to game this thing to give myself, um, how do I say this? Like a uh, the, that that differentiated chance at winning that I was sort of expressing at before. How do you how do you put your thing on the easy setting? And if your thesis is good, like I mentioned before, and you really believe that my lemon squeezer is going to be better than anything else in the market, then I just call it like just freaking pump the fire hose, man. Just run it and, and know that not all of it's going to work and that's fine, but give it everything and and give it its full chance to, to actually reach maturation. All right. Okay. Yeah. So that's it for the questions from the audience. Um, I think we're right at the time to start wrapping up so we can do the wheel or we can uh, do that afterwards um, if we're tight on time. But yeah, what do you think, Norm? Why don't we uh, go for the the wheel? We got to give uh, John some time to get onto his call. Okay, here we go. I'll just pull up the wheel. This we is the first time for you, John. Today. It is. Oh yeah. All right, so, here we uh, go. You might want to turn down the the volume on your computer. Okay. Here we go. It's time for the wheel of Elsie. Okay, thank you everyone for submitting. We'll try and do this quickly. Uh, this is for the 30 minute consult with John. Uh, if you are the winner, please contact me at k at lunchwithnorm.com and I will uh, figure out everything. I'll connect you. So here we go. Three, two, one. Here we go. Who is the winner? There we go. All right, Simon. Simon. Oh, man. All right, Simon. Okay. And then we have got one more wheel here. Just give me one second. And Simon knows how to get in contact with you, Kels? Uh, yes, he knows. Okay. Uh, okay. Just a second. We're 
I closed the wrong tab. Okay, actually, um, we'll save the the second wheel to the after John leaves because we oh, uh, closed the wrong tab. Up. But oh, I messed God. up. But uh, okay, just well, he's not getting paid this week, and and right after this, I will scream at him. <laughs> everything we said not to do all right so john thanks a lot for coming on hopefully you can come back on this is your first time uh we've got to get you on again it is man yeah happy, happy to come on i love uh I, I love talking shop so to me it's uh it's always a pleasure perfect and uh, i'm not sure we can talk about this a bit later but i uh, love to have you on my club in my clubhouse room um you know talking it's a it's a really great audience there as well cool you got it man all right well we'll see you later john thank you for joining us Thanks for having me. Yeah. We'll see you later. See you later. All right, everybody. So now it's time for the Wheel of Kelsey once again. Or maybe not. Maybe it'll just be me talking. I need a couple couple of minutes just to do this. So if you can uh, fill up just two more minutes and I'll be okay. right there. All right. So anyways, why don't we talk about uh, the next episode? We are going to be talking. This is very exciting. Everybody's been asking about it. But um, on Wednesday, we're going to have Mikkel Chapnick on. And we're going to be talking about selling on Walmart. Yes, it's the big one. Uh, there's a lot of talk about people moving off Amazon, staying on Amazon, but finding other channels. Walmart is number two right now. It, ta it took over the number two position it uh it passed ebay just recently and it's growing at 40 percent walmart.com is growing at 40 percent quarter after quarter so how's that for growth so uh Mikkel is an expert in the business she has her own group she has um a course that she has so join us on uh wednesday for that i'm lo really looking forward to it and again, while we're uh, waiting for Kelsey to we're get good. the stick. Oh, good okay. Now. Very good. All right. So here we go. Hopefully I got everyone. We'll do this quickly. Three, two, one. This is for stable coppers, uh, phone patch, copper phone patch. And thank you, Marsha, for the donation. Yes. Andrew C is the winner. So All Andrew right, C, Andrew. please contact me at k at lunchwithdorm.com. Okay. And there we go. Okay, uh, Amar, talking a bit more about train shipping versus sea. Yeah, we could talk about a, a variety of different types of shipping, air shipping, high speed vessel. Um, anyways, we will we will get to that at a future show. Okay, as I was going to say, just another big thank you to our sponsor for this episode, uh, Global Wired Advisors. They're a leading digital investment bank focused on optimizing the business sale process. For more information, please visit globalwiredadvisors.com. All right, and also, today's Monday. You want to make sure that you check out our newsletter that doesn't suck. Uh, you can go to lunchwithnorm.com or normanferrar.com. Sign up for the newsletter and you'll see it's solid content. Uh, anything else there, Kels? I think you covered it. Join us, uh, join our Facebook group, Lunch with Norm, Amazon FBA, and e-commerce collective. And I think that's about it. Oh, smash those subscribe smash buttons, those like buttons over at uh, YouTube. We're so yes. close to a thousand people. So close people. to a thousand. Yeah. All right. Okay. So join us every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at noon Eastern Standard Time. Guys, thank you for joining us today, uh, for being part of our community. We couldn't do this without you. And enjoy the rest of your day. Lunch with the, lunch with the, lunch with the.